scientists are learning more and more about how human brains work and how many of us don't fit into the old-fashioned understanding of how brains should work. But a lot of ideas about parenting and familial relationships still need to catch up to the reality of human variation. Neurological differences are natural, profoundly valuable parts of being in a community together and in being part of a family. Whoever you are, wherever you are in your journey, I am here to explore with you. We are all in this together. Welcome to Neurodivergent. Neurodiverging. Neurodiverging is dedicated to helping neurodiverse folk find the resources we need to live better lives as individuals and to further disability awareness and social justice efforts to improve all of our lives as part of the larger world community. If you're interested in learning more, you can please click the subscribe button to make sure you're notified when there's a new episode. Take a look around at the previous podcast episodes and the blog posts on neurodiverging.com. And please check us out on Patreon to support this podcast and the blog, patreon.com slash neurodiverging. Speaking of Patreon, I'd love to give a very, very warm thank you to Zach, David, Teresa, Sarah, Anon, Teresa, Outstronaut, Clara, and Marty. Thank you all so much for supporting this episode of Neurodiverging. Today, I am so pleased to present our guest, Dr. Roy Richard Grinker, Professor of Anthropology at George Washington University and Editor-in-Chief of Anthropological Quarterly. We're discussing his newest book, Nobody's Normal, How Culture Created the Stigma of Mental Illness, which came out in January 2021 from Norton. Dr. Grinker conducted research on the epidemiology of autism, which he discusses in his previous book, Unstrange Minds. Unstrange Minds was inspired by his daughter, Isabel, who is diagnosed with autism in 1994, and documents Grinker's global quest to discover why autism is so much more common today. Building on Unstrange Minds and based on research in Africa, Asia, and the United States, his new book, Nobody's Normal, tells the uplifting story of how we are all successfully challenging the stigma that has long shadowed mental illnesses. I found Nobody's Normal to be an accessible yet deep dive into how the advent of capitalism irrevocably changed Western society by creating many of the boundaries we take for granted today, including wellness and illness. Grinker challenged many of my assumptions about autism and how we as advocates engage in our push for more understanding and acceptance of neurodivergent individuals, and I am still thinking about his work many months after I finished reading. Without further ado, here's the interview. Hi, Richard. Thank you for joining us on Neurodiverging today. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to talk to you about my book. I'm very pleased. So can you start off just by telling us a little bit about your book? I really loved reading it. It was a great read. Thank you. Well, it's called Nobody's Normal, How Culture Created the Stigma of Mental Illness. And um, I, I really intended it to be an upbeat book. You know, so many books about Mental illnesses, developmental disabilities are about tragedies and about unhappiness. And I really have seen so much that is positive. And I really felt like I wanted to uh, figure out you know, why I thought so positively about things these days. What were the factors that led us to these positive changes? And if we can identify those factors, can we reinforce them? Mm -hmm. and continue on the same path. Yeah, it was a really positive read. And it was also a very accessible for being sort of an academic book that covers a long period of history. Um, it was a very accessible book, which I really enjoyed and appreciated. Was that something you set out to do specifically when you were writing it or a happy accident? Well, yeah, so my definitely, um, you know, one of the things that you can do when you get to be um, a little more senior and you feel like your job is secure <laughs> is you can experiment and try to write in new ways. And I've been writing for a general population now for about, uh, you know, 20 years. My uh, probably, you know, this is my most accessible book, uh, but 
in 2008, I published On Strange Minds, Remapping the World of Autism. And it was a book that sought to uh, trace the origins of the autism spectrum mm -hmm. and also to weave within it the story of my own daughter's experiences with autism. So she was born in 1991 and she was diagnosed when she was a little over two very early diagnosis in those Pretty days. Early. And she um, is now almost 30 years old. And she was born just at the time that autism was becoming a much more popular term and that the spectrum was broadening and the stigma of autism was decreasing and people weren't uh, thinking of it as this sort of narrow definition that it used to be. And now she's living in this world where everybody seems to know what autism is. Mm -hmm. And where we have the spectrum broadening considerably, and there's so many more opportunities for people with autism. And so that's not the kind of thing you can write about through a academic lens. Yeah. You know, you it's something that you want people to get engaged with. And so when I approached this new book, Nobody's Normal, I wanted to do the same thing, not so much with my daughter, but my family. You see, uh, my great grandfather was a psychiatrist. My grandfather was a psychiatrist. My father was a psychiatrist. I'm married to a psychiatrist. I work on mental illness. And I thought, why not kind of weave the history of psychiatry in with that four generations of work in my family on mental illness to sort of use that as a lens for seeing how much has changed? It was a really interesting approach. And the personality and all of your family history that's woven into the book and your um, the sort of emotional resonance of your experience with your daughter's your daughter's diagnosis and your daughter's uh -huh. life of on the autism spectrum really came through in the book and it made it like you said much more engaging much more able to lean into it emotionally and i also just loved looking at stigma and mental illness through the lens of this is structured this is like a created human created structural institution of how we think about health how we think about the medical system and just the history of the the profession of psychiatry could be really dry, but was instead really, really interesting. Well, thank you. Yeah. I mean, it is it is really amazing how recent it is yes. that we have accepted certain kinds of fixed categories, mm -hmm. right? Like the idea that there are distinctly mental disorders versus biological disorders. Or, or even if, or even race and ethnicity. I mean, mm -hmm. the history of capitalism is kind of the history of making boundaries. Yeah. And what we're doing now, you know, is we're challenging those boundaries, uh, not only in the psychiatrist manual, the DSM, but, but just in everyday life to talk about, you know, when somebody says today that they're on the spectrum, mm -hmm. Maybe they would meet the criteria for ASD in a scientific study. It doesn't mean as much as... But maybe they wouldn't. Yeah, maybe they would. Right? Mm -hmm. And I think we're just, we're dissolving some of these boundaries to see ourselves not as you have this or you don't have this, you're normal, you're abnormal, but that w we all exist on a spectrum, on a continuum of all kinds of different things, whether it's whether it's autism or anxiety or, or depression or whatever. And... This is not to say that we shouldn't uh, do research and treat people and uh, try to alleviate suffering. It's just that we're on a spectrum. And for some of us, we might go over the border into where we're suffering enough that we need help. Mm -hmm. um, anxiety, for example, is something all humans have to have to mm -hmm. survive. If I didn't have anxiety, I would not look both ways when I crossed the street and I would be hit by a car and not be here. So I have to have anxiety to survive. But does that anxiety, perhaps at some point in my life, bleed over into the over the boundary where now I can't sleep or I can't work or my social relationships are impaired and I need help? Yeah. So there are people who are really critical of my view that it's good to use mental illness, developmental disability terms colloquially. Mm -hmm. They say, no, that, that masks the real suffering of the real serious illness. But I kind of think that when we use these terms colloquially, when you say, if you're a neat Nick, you're a little OCD, you're socially awkward, you say you're a little on the spectrum, that we're disarming those words. We're making it harder for them to hurt. Yeah. You know, because they're just, they become part of our, 
our everyday discourse. And, and so, you know, I have a difference of opinion there. Yeah. <laughs> no, it is a hard thing to think through because I know, for example, just speaking from my background with autism communities, that a lot of us have really struggled first to get a, di a diagnosis, especially if we're like me, a uh, woman born in the 80s, that a lot of us haven't been diagnosed or discovered to have autism, quote unquote, until we're in our 30s. So we've lived a long life of not having the supports we needed. And we've really struggled to get to the point where we can be autistic, can call ourselves autistic. And so it can feel like disempowering to take that label and apply it sort of more widely into other kinds of people. But at the same time, I hear what you're saying that in lots of ways, the idea of autism or anxiety or any other sort of mental health issue can be used as a stigmatizing term and can be used to disempower people in the other direction. And so mm -hmm. for me, it's all about finding finding the language we can use to get get everybody feeling empowered as best we can and able to access the treatment and support that they need. Yeah. Well, when you're talking about empowerment, I mean, that's what the great thing about the neurodiversity movement is that it is one, it is like like the civil rights movement, like disability rights movement, like transgender rights movement. It is a movement in which people take ownership of a term and they say, we're going to define ourselves by ourselves mm -hmm. and we're not going to accept, you know, some previously, um, you know, applied definition that was used to marginalize us. And I, but I do think it's important to understand that the value of a concept, like any diagnostic concept, whether it's autism or anything else, is different at different stages in life. Absolutely. And so for a 30 year old, um, having this framework of autism can explain things to you. You know, it can say, oh, this is why I understand now why I've, I'm good at this or I'm, I'm, I'm challenged at that. Mm -hmm. I can understand, it's a framework that helps me to understand myself and even communicate about myself to others. But if you're five years old, it the word autism <laughs> is important for a different reason mm -hmm. because it drives a service. Mm -hmm. It drives your special education or it drives your accommodation or it mm -hmm. drives the kinds of um, interactions that the, you know, the, your parents or your friends or your experts or whoever think are useful. Mm -hmm. So a diagnosis is only as good as its value to us at a particular point in time. Absolutely, yeah, no, I agree with that. And we sort of danced around it a little bit, but you mentioned capitalism a couple of times as the system or the force that really brought about um, some of the boundaries that we're currently living under and some of the institutional structures we're currently living under. And to get like more into the meat of your book, the formation of capitalism was when the idea of like the ideal person changed. And I was wondering if we could talk I think we have a very different understanding of historically what was a healthy person or what was a mentally well person. And then now <laughs> what we consider. Yeah. Well, I, I spent a lot of time talking about, uh, about capitalism, but as you say, it's not in a dry way. It's not dry. Oh history. no, it's fantastic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, but here's the thing. Uh, it's not that capitalism created mental illnesses or even mental illness terms. It's that capitalism created the conditions mm -hmm. within which scientists could posit that there were different kinds of conditions and that you could define something as distinctly mental yes. or distinctly biological. And so how did that happen? The ideal person in the past had been somebody who was in Europe, at least, you know, living uh, for God and doing what he or she could on this family farm or where, whatever they were doing. And with capitalism, we get a transition where now the ideal person is not tied to their family or to religion. The ideal person is the maximizer, the producer, the autonomous, independent individual. And so kinship ties become loosened urbanization begins. And all of a sudden, family members are bringing unproductive members of their family to asylums. Mm -hmm. And the, 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 the mandate for asylums, the first asylums in the, the early industrial revolution in France and England, was not to take care of people who were sick. It was to house the idle mm -hmm. and to try 
and do something with people who were not contributing to the economy. Yeah. And so they lumped together criminals, paupers, um, people with physical disabilities, with, with uh, mental illnesses. And all of a sudden, scientists had a large group of people together. And for the first time, they could look at them as a large group and say, hmm, there are different types here. We could classify these into different groups. And that, from the asylums, is where we get the invention of prisons. There were no prisons before the asylums because they said, let's move the criminals someplace else. That's where we get the invention of a distinctly mental illness. Mm -hmm. It's even, by the way, quite counterintuitively, where we get the idea that there should be fixed sexes of male and female. Mm -hmm. But um, there is, 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 I'm trying to say that it's not that uh, mental illnesses didn't exist before. People suffered depressions and they'd suffered anxiety and so on, but they weren't labeled, identified, stigmatized for a distinctly mental illness. Mm -hmm. They were, may have been stigmatized or marginalized for whatever they had, yeah. meaning they're, they're not useful mm -hmm. or they're a problem or they're violent or whatever it might have been, but not because they had something called a mental illness. Yeah. That gets invented. Pretty late in human history. Yeah. I mean, all kinds of things get invented pretty late. I, I mean... <laughs> Uh, there was no, sure, there were like men who had sex with men and women who had sex with women, you know, all the, as for as long as anybody can, has a historical record, but it only became something called homosexuality, a kind of person, yeah. a type of human being with some kind of inner personality or disposition that led to a certain sexual orientation in the late 1800s. Mm -hmm. In fact, the word homosexuality doesn't even enter the Oxford English Dictionary until 1976. Yes. And its first usage in the um, uh, clinical, in the uh, psychological literature is 1892. Mm -hmm. So we really don't see some of these things until very, very um, late where, I, where these, these terms of pathology come to be applied to a person as a whole, as if it completely constitutes them. Yeah. So your self-identity is as the homosexual person, as the disabled person, and not much else. Like that's who you are. And if you're disabled, you're disabled because you are not fitting into you are not producing the ideals capitalism. Yeah. of capitalism. <laughs> and so, you know, essentially the, um, the, the ideology that we have today in the United States, you know, where we just say the autonomous, the producer, the independent person, 18, 21, better leave the house, stake your, your claim out on the world <laughs> as this completely independent person, which, you know, we know that's an illusion. It's just an ideology, but that is something that, that, that gets, um, is born in the industrial revolution. So when I look at all of these campaigns, like stopping stigma, mm -hmm campaigns, they tend to focus on education and awareness as if somehow the stigma of mental illnesses is produced by ignorance. Yeah. It's not, mm -hmm. it's not ignorance and it's not lack of education or lack of awareness. Stigma is something that is deeply rooted in the history of how we value certain kinds of human beings. Mm -hmm. The concept of abnormality and normality, those are both concepts that really are about what we value in a human being. Mm -hmm. And part of the goal of this book is to say that the way in which the neurodiversity movement, the way in which other kinds of movements are reevaluating what is a meaningful life and what is a valuable life is the thing that is changing stigma, not, you know, somebody reads a book yeah. on autism. It has to do with what we now see as valuable. The story that I tell in the book that, you know, still gives me goosebumps because I was there um, is when my daughter was graduating from high school and she was asked to give a speech and nobody with a disability had ever given a speech. And there were 3,000 people at Daughters of the American Revolution, Constitution Hall, across the way from the White House. 
And most of these kids didn't know her because she'd been in self-contained special ed classes. And she started to give her speech and she has a very unusual rhythm, kind of a sing song pattern. And, um, and she's also very formal too in the way she talks. And you could hear whispering and some snickering in the audience, like just people murmuring. Murmuring, you know, murmurs are the sounds of stigma. And then she gets to a sentence where she says, people with autism like me. And then you could just feel the room get quiet. And it wasn't that somehow she's now being stigmatized, quite the opposite. It was that people now had a framework yeah. for understanding her so that what had been seen as enig en enigmatic or, or weird even now made sense. Because by that time, when she graduated, autism was like something all these kids knew about. Yeah. And it made sense to them. And, it, and they, were, they were like, oh, now I get it. Why she's, <laughs> she talks about, she's got autism, fine. And then she give her a standing ovation. Mm -hmm. So the framing has changed over all the time. You know, how we define something changes over time. I yes. mean, the word autism, if somebody had said they were autistic back in 1970, the audience would probably say, well, get off the stage or, and why are they asking a person with autism to speak? Or they would say, well, they can speak, therefore they're not autistic. I mean, something like- I was thinking they, about they would have been how- Something like that. Yeah, I was thinking about how we were talking about how uh, with the formation of capitalism, you start to see these identities as being applied to the whole person. Like we were just talking about a couple minutes ago and what your story, for me is a really good example of how that is still functioning in the current day that we're still seeing now that we have this identification of autism for this woman, like, okay, we get it. But outside of that, there's still, so the stigma seems to be functioning within this unknowing space, right? Like the label is reducing. I really, yeah. Yeah. And I think also, I mean, it's not to say that there aren't still many conditions that are highly stigmatized. Like the two of the most highly stigmatized um, uh, psychiatric disorders are substance abuse mm -hmm. and schizophrenia. Why? So you might say, oh, well, it's because the person with substance abuse, maybe they're criminals or the person with schizophrenia might be frightening or whatever. But I really think that it has to do with the fact that those particular conditions threaten those capitalist and industrial ideas of autonomy, mm -hmm. self-control. Yeah. Uh, that's what characterizes the fear mm -hmm. of those. And I'm, I'm very strongly opposed to uh, attempts to eradicate stigma by reframing everything in biological terms. I wanted to talk to you about that because I know towards the end of your book, you discussed that having mental illness as a, framing it as a neurobiological, as coming from something neurobiological creates further stigma as opposed to lessening it. And that's, you know, as a neurodiversity advocate, a lot of us do lean on that our brains are different sort of talking point, right? Like ADHD brains are different, autistic brains are different than neurotypical brains. But, you know, I, I did hear what you're saying that you wanna move away from that sort of neurobiological cause. So we know that there are environmental causes, there are other reasons for our traits that define us as autistic, but what are different approaches that neurodiversity advocates could take that actually do work to lessen stigma that aren't this neurobiological, our brains are different kind of approach? Do you have any ideas for that? Well, the only thing that has really worked to uh, lessen the stigma of any developmental disability or disability, uh, mental illness, is when society takes some of the blame. Mm -hmm when we decide that the, it's the environment that the person lives in that is partly responsible for the degree to which they are able to do, do the things they want to do in life, mm -hmm. um, the degree to which they're suffering. You know, the most simple example of this is the person who's in a wheelchair and uses a wheelchair. Um, and that person is disabled only when there are no ramps or elevators, when the environment makes it so that they cannot do what they want to do. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise, we could say that they don't have a disability at all, yes. right? Um, and similarly, when somebody has autism, if we don't value 
what they do and how they do it and 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 the 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 quirks and unusual and and distinct aspects of their personalities just as we value the different personalities of everybody else then we're going to keep stigmatizing them mm -hmm. but the person with autism today in this environment of 2021 is able to achieve so much more than they could in 1970 mm -hmm. or 1960 and that's not because they have a different condition no it's because we have a different society we have a society that allows remote work mm -hmm. we have a society that has removed the categorical idea that you have a disease or you don't have a disease and we're looking at things on a spectrum that is now valuing certain kinds of knowledge that people with quote unquote autistic brains may be good at. Mm -hmm. um, the environment changes, even if potentially the condition itself doesn't. Now that's a little simplistic since we know that experience itself changes the structure of the brain. Mm -hmm. I mean, we know that. We know that social supports make a big difference. Now let's just take autism during the pandemic. There are people with autism who during the pandemic have actually blossomed. Mm -hmm. They've become more social. I know many of them. Yeah. Okay. They've made new friends. They, particularly if they're in high school and they're acutely aware of their differences, they may have much less social anxiety because they're not having to face that difficulty in the school. Mm -hmm. And they may have times to, and they don't come home exhausted and they can explore other interests like art or music or whatever it might be. But at the same time, there are, are a lot of people whose um, symptoms are changing. They don't have a cohesive family. They needed the structure that they've lost. Mm -hmm. They've regressed and lost certain kinds of skills that they worked really hard to develop. They, the, their, their parents and, um, or caregivers and them, they don't know how to interact with each other in this, the way that they used to. And there are children now, some of them who are, are going into residential placements because, mm -hmm. um, because of the stresses and, and the decline of their, their skills that they had developed previously, they've regressed. And so you have, um, the, the environment makes a huge difference. Yeah. You just can't underestimate that. And I think the pandemic has shown that where some people have done gone one way and other people have gone another. I think also the research that is happening in the scientific arena is really starting to show us that, um, both the neurobiological research hasn't translated yet into anything to help people, right? So yeah. we know you said ADHD brains are different. Yeah, but that doesn't change. That doesn't, that knowledge doesn't mean there's better special education. No, it does not. We know that people with schizophrenia have different brain circuitry, but that doesn't do anything to the history of discrimination or poverty or downward drift mm -hmm. in schizophrenia. Um, so they're, they're recognizing that there hasn't been that kind of translation, but there's, they're also recognizing that it just seems folly to make these reductions. Mm -hmm. Take epigenetics. We know that somebody who has experienced trauma in their life can have alterations, not in their genes, but in the regulators and the enhancers that are adjacent to genes mm -hmm. that can be passed on to progeny. Yeah. Lamarck wasn't entirely wrong, it seems. <laughs> you can pass things on. And so people who've experienced great trauma, whether it's famine or genocide or growing up under very adverse childhood circumstances, um, that there can be intergenerational trauma. And in those cases, it then makes absolutely no sense to call something a biological condition or a mental condition mm -hmm. because They're so it's neither. It's, yeah. it's, 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 it's just so much more complex than that. Yeah. Sorry to be so long-winded. No, you it's asked, totally fine. You asked a complicated question. <laughs> I know they're all complicated. And I, I did, um, one of the things I really liked about your book was that everything rested on everything else. And I really enjoyed your history of, I think it was a comparison between the World War I vets and their um, reactions to traumatic experiences versus sure. the World War II. The wars, yeah. Yeah, um, because you did sort of draw into this idea that folks in World War I were framed their life in a certain way. And so when they experienced significant trauma in the 
in the war, their reactions were this set of symptoms. But then by World War II, we had a totally different understanding. And the men who were injured or had great trauma in World War II had completely different post-traumatic stress, quote unquote, symptoms. And that was just so interesting as an illustration of how the kind of physical wellness of the body and the brain-based, you know, mental illness are yeah. so intertwined and are so um, fused together. And well, that's just another example of how difficult it is to separate yeah. um, ourselves from the environments in which we live, right? If you live in a society that you know legitimates suffering that is physical, but stigmatizes suffering that is mental, you will experience mental suffering as if it is physical. It was so interesting. Yeah. I really right? like that. You'll have you'll have stomach aches and headaches and 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 numbness and even partial paralysis, not because you really have a fundamentally different condition, but because it's what Freud called the sense of symptoms. We when when we're sick, we have the symptoms that make sense to us and to the people to whom we're trying to communicate. Mm -hmm. And so by World War II, uh, psychoanalysis is taking hold and people have becoming, are becoming much more comfortable talking about mood and anxiety and neurosis and things like that. And so you see them start to experience suffering that way. Mm -hmm through psychological terms. But one of the reasons I focused on the wars is that I was trying, as I said earlier, to figure out what are the factors that exacerbate or minimize stigma. And during and right after every war, I found all of these articles in which people said, the stigma of mental illness has disappeared because we've seen in World War I that even the the, the best and the brightest when exposed to trauma um, will suffer. Mm -hmm. And then you, then it changes and stigmatized again. And then another war comes along. And at, in 1945 or 1946, the New York Times said of my grandfather that he had eradicated the stigma of mental illness. <laughs> and he made the claim, yes, there's no, these men were not abnormal that I treated uh, through, you know, through psychiatric therapies. Uh, they were normal people in abnormal circumstances. And I have to wonder whether this pandemic is going to do something similar. Can anybody say they haven't been emotionally affected, significantly emotionally affected over the past year? That would be pretty tough for anybody to say. And what wars and this pandemic have in common is that everybody is subject to these stressors. And so if everybody's subjected to those stressors, then certain forms of suffering become reasonable, acceptable, even expectable. Thank you again for joining me on Neurodiverging today. I hope you enjoyed that episode. I certainly learned a lot from Richard's book and I'm so happy to have had the opportunity to have re read it and to have spoken with him. If you'd like access to the after show for this episode, plus lots of other patron only perks, please consider pledging a dollar, five dollars or ten dollars a month to help support Neurodiverging through Patreon at patreon.com slash neurodiverging. You can find more information about Richard, the books we talked about, and everything else in the show notes, which is linked below. And as always, have a great week. And remember, we are all in this together.